Hi, everybody. Dr. Malcolm Butler here. I am a family physician at Columbia Valley Community Health, and I am also the health officer for Chelan and Douglas counties. I appreciate you taking a few minutes uh, with me today. Um, I have some graphs and data to share with you first, and then a few questions that we're going to run through. So let's get started. Okay, so this uh, first graphic is just showing uh, the data we have as of yesterday. The important number is sort of this one in red down here. So the incidence uh, in our two counties is 694, just about 700. And that's the number of cases we have seen uh, per 100,000 population in the last two weeks. Uh, you'll see also that we currently have 32 people hospitalized with COVID. And uh, throughout the pandemic, we're reporting 38 mortalities. I think this curve is probably more interesting. This is also showing us the incidence um, over the past 14 days. And um, what these uh, red bars represent the holidays. So we're going starting at uh, October 1st and going through yesterday. <clears throat> uh, so this red bar is Thanksgiving. This is Christmas. This is uh, New Year's. And you can see that we surged and got up just above 1,000 uh, in the early part of December. We started back down, and um, right now we're just a, uh, above, or, or very close, I'm sorry, to 700. And you can see it looks like this curve is beginning to swing back up. And we actually anticipated that happening. We knew that following the holidays, when people were gathering together, we would see an increase. Um, honestly, we expected to see an increase after Thanksgiving, and we did not see one, which I think is a testament to all of us who uh, made some hard decisions not to gather with friends and family over the holidays. So we are hopeful that we're not going to see very much of a surge, but I think we're going to continue seeing these numbers go up for the next week, and then hopefully they'll start back down. So this uh, slide now is looking at the uh, testing by week. Um, the far left is all the way back in April. The far right is through the end of last week. And you can see that over the last six weeks, we've gradually done less and less testing overall. Um, and this 15% here is the percent of the tests which turned positive. And so everybody's aware that the more people you test, the more positives you find. So it's actually that percentage of the total tests which we track. And uh, the governor made an announcement a, a few days ago talking about when restaurants might be able to reopen and fitness centers and that sort of thing. And one of the indicators uh, he is looking at is this test positivity rate. And that needs to be below 10%. Um, for us to move to the next uh, phase of reopening. So right now we're at 15%. This graphic is looking at how many COVID uh, people, and that's not a nice way of saying it, how many people suffering from COVID are in our hospitals right now. Um, this middle graph is looking at the uh, Okanagan County and Chelan County hospitals. Um, red are people with COVID. Yellow are people who we expect have COVID, but we're still waiting for their tests to come back. Uh, and what you can see is um, that we kind of peaked out back again in the early part of December, and these numbers have begun to come down. So that's reassuring. It means that our healthcare system is a, a little bit less burdened by COVID. Um, this graph over here is actually looking at all of the hospitals in Eastern Washington. And you can see roughly the same thing uh, where these numbers are uh, beginning to come down. Um, what we do see over here, this is the number of people in the ICU on a ventilator. And you can see right now that there are 14 people in the ICU, 13 on ventilators. Now, they are not um, necessarily all COVID patients, but the point is the ICU is full right now and actually um, as of uh, the other day, the uh, ICU was on diversion. So they had no more room and they were looking around at other hospitals in the state that we could send our sick patients to. So what I want you to take away from this is that um, the hospital is full, but happily it's full of uh, 
things that are more than just COVID. Um, okay. This now is looking in the past month at the ages of people who tested positive. And I really don't see much change over the past month, pretty steady all the way across. Actually, it's a little bit more spread out than it was a few months ago. Still, most of the disease is in this group here between the ages of 20 and 50. Um, there is more than there used to be in the 10 to 20 year olds. And this is the, uh, these three bars up here, what I sort of keep an eye on because those are the elderly who are the most um, vulnerable to the badness of uh, COVID-19. Uh, this graphic is looking at where uh, the positives have been um, in uh, the last couple of weeks. And uh, this is by city, this is in Chelan County. Obviously this bar stands out quite a bit. This is Dryden. Um, and so what I would say Dryden is very hot right now. Now there's a problem when you do statistics like this because in a very small town, it only takes one or two households, maybe one or two big families who are sick to really drive the numbers very high. Um, so, and we know Dryden is a, a smaller community, so I'm sure that's a part of it. You can see Ardenvoir also, which is up the Enniot Valley is quite hot, but again, a very small community. Kashmir here is relatively hot. Also, they have been for um, several weeks now. Um, and then across the board, everyone else is more or less between 600 and, and 1200, which is very hot related to the rest of the state. Um, this is Douglas County. And I think what you'll see is here, East Wenatchee is very hot and Rock Island, which of course is contiguous with East Wenatchee, next door neighbors. So, and I don't think this is a problem of small numbers. I think this is true and that there's quite a few uh, people carrying COVID right now in East Wenatchee and Rock Island. All right, this is looking at the percent of positives by ethnicity. The light blue are uh, Hispanic, our Hispanic neighbors. The dark blue are our non-Hispanic neighbors. Um, and you can see we're still cruising right along 50%. Hispanic. Again, only 31% of the population uh, self-describes as Hispanic. So this is still a disproportionate share of COVID in the Hispanic community. And of course, we all know this by now, but um, our Hispanic neighbors are doing much more of the essential uh, work than uh, non-Hispanic neighbors in our communities. Um, these are our mortalities. This actually has not changed in the last couple of weeks. Uh, what you can see, blue is male. So you can see, I don't know if you can tell, but I'll tell you it's true. Um, there are more mortalities who have been men than women in green. You'll see that two thirds of the people who have passed away from COVID are over the age of 70. But still, we have had people pass away who are under the age of 70. And we've even had uh, three people who are in their 40s who have died of COVID. So it's uh, hitting all ages of adults. This graph is interesting. I have not shown this to you before. <clears throat> this is actually looking at influenza. So this is different than COVID. This is influenza, the thing that we're used to having at this time of year all the time. And this is uh, state level data, Washington state. And it is uh, the percentage of emergency room visits which are related to influenza. And it's looking at the past three years and then this year, this year is in dark green. So dark blue, I'm sorry, light uh, green was last year, dark blue the year before, light blue the year before that. <clears throat> and the weeks across the bottom are how you might count weeks during the year. So week 52 here was actually the end of December, right? The last week of the year. And that's what this data is through. And you can see that it's very common that around the 44th week, 46th week, everybody starts getting sick with influenza. These curves go up. But this year, absolutely flat. So it's like there is no influenza going on this year in the middle of flu season. And I just think that's really interesting. I think it's interesting for a couple of reasons. One is, as a physician, I have always felt that influenza was the biggest and baddest infection we had to cope with. And we found that we can wipe it out. 
And we can wipe it out just by using our masks and distancing and washing our hands. And I think some people might say, yeah, but what about flu shots? Maybe this year there are more flu shots given. And that's not true. We've given a lot of flu shots this year, but we've given about the same number that we've given in the last three years also. So this isn't related to flu shots. This is related to masking and distancing and hygiene. The other thing that's interesting though, is that even though we've been able to essentially wipe out influenza with masking and distancing and hygiene, we are still in the middle of an incredible outbreak of COVID. So I've said many times, and I'll say again, COVID is almost the perfect virus for infecting humans. It's breaking through things that influenza can't come close to breaking through. And I think a large reason for that is because in influenza, almost everybody is symptomatic. All, every time you have influenza or anybody else's influenza, they feel so sick that they stay home in bed, you know, drinking chicken soup. Um, and in COVID, that's not true. Um, at least 40% of people are asymptomatic and probably a lot of the spread is coming from those people because they feel totally fine and they just walk out of the house and go to work or go hang out with friends and that's when the transmission happens. So interesting, so far this year we're seeing no influenza. So those are the ends of the graphics and uh, we'll go and answer some questions. Okay, we've got some questions for you today. The first one is, please explain the rationale for getting tested if you are not sick. I could test negative today and get it next week. Don't studies show that there is no transmission from asymptomatic people? So you actually bring up a couple of points here that I want to um, address. I think one of the terrible weaknesses of testing is just as you say, you could get tested today and be negative and you could contract the virus tomorrow. So testing negative today doesn't predict anything about the future. And, and you know, in, in that way, you're right, it kind of doesn't make a lot of sense. And it's the only thing we've got. So because so many people are asymptomatic, we need people to come in and get tested even when they're fine, feeling fine, so that we can identify people who are asymptomatic but contagious and we can help them to stay at home and isolate themselves. And our hope has been that if we can test broadly enough, we can start finding all these people who are asymptomatic and keep them at home to wipe out uh, the transmission. So I've made an analogy to whack-a-mole. I don't know if you re remember that game that's at the carnival, um, but it's the game where the mole sticks its head up you know, through the holes and you've got to hit it with a hammer. And that's kind of what it feels like sometimes as we're doing this testing. We're just waiting for it to pop up and then we want to test everybody around it so we can push it back down. It is very inefficient and it is very expensive. And again, it's all we got. The second point though, is you say, isn't it true that studies show there's no transmission from asymptomatic people? That is absolutely wrong. And as I mentioned just before, there's a huge amount of transmission from asymptomatic people. And I think that's what makes COVID different than influenza. So identifying asymptomatic people is super important. Now, if you are feeling fine and somebody tells you that you have been a close contact with somebody else who just tested positive, it's super important that you go and get tested because now we know you're actually at high risk. Even though you're asymptomatic, you're at high risk. And if we can prove that you are positive, then we can encourage you to isolate at home and uh, and if you're negative, then you don't need to, you still need to quarantine. Um, but that, that's really, we're trying to really focus on testing who've, people who've been exposed. Uh, but for sure, asymptomatic people can transmit COVID. And great questions. Um, second question. Uh, I got tested for COVID before Christmas. I didn't get my results until after Christmas. This turnaround in results needs to be faster. What is the health district doing to get our results to us faster? I totally agree. It needs to be faster. Um, and it's difficult. Obviously, if it was easy to get it done faster, we'd have been doing that. So this question actually reminds me a little bit of a sign I saw once in a restaurant. It, you know, it was a pretty nice, it was a sandwich shop I walked into. And the sign on the wall said, 
Um, when it comes to eating out, you get to pick two of the following three options. You can have good food, or you can have cheap food, or you can have fast food. And so what they're saying is, you know, you can get good food, um, I'm sorry, good food that is cheap is not going to be fast, and fast food that is good is not going to be cheap. So you only get two, um, good, cheap, or fast. And it's kind of the same with the testing we're doing right now. Um, you can have a very good test, which is actually free, but it takes a long time to get the results back. Or you can get a test which is not quite as good, but you can get the test results back in 30 minutes. So I suspect what happened to you was you went to one of our uh, public testing events prior to Christmas. And those events are being run um, by the state of Washington and they're doing the PCR test. PCR test is the best test we have. It's a molecular test, um, genetic type of test, but it has to be sent out of the area to a lab outside of our counties uh, where it can be run. And that takes time. It takes time to run it there. And then in the middle of a surge, like around Christmas time, they're super busy. So it takes them a few days to run it. And then we have to run through the long list of people calling them their results. So that takes even longer. Um, so inexpensive, very good, but takes a long time to get the results back. The other test we have is the antigen test. And right now, most of the clinics, Confluence Health, Columbia Valley, Lake Chelan, Cascade, are using the antigen test. The antigen test is not quite as good, but we get the results back in 30 minutes. Also, it's a little bit expensive because in many places, you actually have to go in for a clinic visit to um, have the testing done. So from a public health standpoint, our answer to your frustration is we're using that antigen test. Now, we could talk about this for a long time for statistical reasons. That antigen test is best in someone who has symptoms. It is most accurate in checking someone with symptoms. In an asymptomatic person, maybe like uh, you, the person who asked this question before Christmas, it's not as good. So the PCR test that you had was actually the preferred test, but it's kind of hopeless if you don't get the results back before Christmas, which is why you were getting tested. So I agree with you and it's a tension between those things, accurate and inexpensive or not quite as good, but quick. And we have both um, and it's complicated. So thank you for that. All right. So um, by this time of the year, everyone in my house would have gotten a flu shot. I'm not complaining, but are these safety measures for COVID impacting flu season? Are we going to have an easy um, flu or cold season this year? And that is just what I was talking about in the, in the slide deck. It is amazing, <clears throat> excuse me. We've seen almost no influenza this year. And so fingers crossed, I think, yes, we're gonna see a very light flu season. Uh, <clears throat> what we have seen in my clinic is that Essentially, everybody coming in with fever, cough, cold, uh, achiness, they have COVID. We haven't seen anybody who's coming in with other problems, um, which is because I think we more or less wiped them out by using masking, distancing, and hygiene. So great question. Thank you. Um, all right. Last question here. Where are we uh, at with vaccinating our healthcare workers? I'd like to know when I can expect to get my vaccine. I don't meet any of the high risk criteria, but I would like to start visiting my elderly parents again. I'm right there with you. Um, so again, you raise a, a couple of points. We're actually doing well right now vaccinating healthcare workers. And so we have uh, divided people up into uh, different phases. And so phase 1A is what we're doing now. And those are first responders and healthcare workers who are most at risk of being in contact with and working with patients who might be COVID positive. So uh, we're pretty much finished vaccinating the hospital staff and uh, the clinics are vaccinating and have almost finished their staff. So now we're actually beginning to reach out to dentists, offices and uh, physical therapists and home health providers and other healthcare staff who may be exposed uh, to COVID positive patients. We've been vaccinating first responders, so ambulance crews, paramedics, uh, police officers, 
um, fire department, all those folks uh, were getting vaccinated right now. Now, it turns out, uh, in contrast to some other parts of the state, we have enough vaccine and we feel ready to move on to the next phase. So we've been talking to the state uh, to see if we can get their permission to move on to what's called phase 1B. And in phase 1B are um, the uh, elderly and medically frail and also essential workers. So we're hoping to get to them within the next two weeks. <clears throat> so uh, you raise another interesting point, which is you don't have any risk factors, but you want to go visit your elderly parents. So just to talk a little bit about uh, the elderly, uh, folks in what we call long-term care facilities, so nursing homes and that sort of thing, they're going to be vaccinated, we believe, by Walgreens. So Walgreens uh, Pharmacy and CVS Pharmacy uh, undertook this challenge and are contracting with the government uh, to go into the nursing homes and vaccinate all of those residents. Um, and I'm not aware that that has started yet in our two counties. I know it has on the other side of the state. So we anticipate that happening fairly soon. So if your parents are in a, a nursing home, hopefully they'll get vaccinated soon. And then if they're not, um, they should uh, receive their vaccine. You know, I'm thinking probably in early February timeline. So again, the, the thing that's important is not so much that you get vaccinated, but it's that your elderly parents get vaccinated. So we wanna make sure that the medically vulnerable get vaccinated first. And so if your parents are elderly, as you describe, they need to get vaccinated. If you could get vaccinated too, then it'd be double safe. Um, and if they're vaccinated, then hopefully at least you could visit them wearing a mask and we can all feel pretty good about that. So that's the end of our questions for today. Again, I appreciate your time. We very much appreciate it when you send us these questions. Uh, and I'll look forward to um, speaking with you again next week. Thanks.